That concludes topical questions, and we now must move on to the questions to the Minister for the Economy. <clears throat> the Minister has given notice to the Speaker that she will not be available to respond to questions as she is overseas. The Minister for Education has therefore agreed to respond to questions on her behalf today. Agus Anish, Iram Sir, Catherine Kelly, Fornia Kesh. I now call Catherine Kelly for a question. Kesh, Deborah Hain, let all question one, please. I thank the member for her question. I suppose in following on from the previous question, I suppose my aim is not to be either stumped or bold in, in, the, in the next 45 minutes in relation to some of the questions. Um, in answer to the question that has been posed, uh, the Transition of Young People into Careers project is a collaborative project jointly funded by the Department of the Economy uh, and by the Department of uh, Education. The project aims to implement a more strategic and joined-up approach to the 14 to 19 education and training provision. We believe that stakeholders are critical to the success of a 14 to 19 strategy. In recognition of this, the project has adopted a co-design approach, working alongside stakeholders to identify key challenges and build the evidence base which will support the development of a future strategy. The project has engaged with a range of stakeholder groups, including young people, parents, schools, further and higher education, training organisations, work-based uh, learning providers and employers. The engagement with young people has been critical and focused on their personal experiences of progressing through the 14 to 19 education and training system. To date, the project has met with a range of uh, youth councils, youth clubs, young people on training programmes and further education students attending South East, uh, the South Eastern Regi uh, Regional College, the North West Regional College and CAFRE. This has included uh, young people aged between 12 and 25 who are from many different backgrounds following a range of pathways. The engagement has been immensely uh, valuable, with the young people clearly articulating areas of strengths and weakness within current provision. Their views inf have informed the work of the project and will support ongoing policy development. It is essential that the 14 to 19 strategy is focused on the needs of our young people. As the development of the strategy progresses, uh, we will continue to ensure that their views are central to this. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Uh, Minister, this strategy will affect students and young people more than any other group. Would you agree that it is essential that student unions and other organisations are afforded adequate opportunity to input into the development of this strategy? I, think it's, I would agree with, him, with the question in terms of the centrality to this. It is important that as we develop the 14 to 19 strategy, it is fit for purpose, and particularly the learner experience of those who have gone through the existing strategy, indeed, with a level of future proofing to make sure that, that whatever is done um, is, um, is fully available, if you like, and indeed is fit for purpose as we move ahead. It is critical, therefore, and I have already indicated that in terms of some of the organisations, such as the Youth Council, uh, such as I think, some of the um, further and higher education. So I think from that point of view, in terms of receiving those submissions, receiving the, those direct one-to-one um, -one engagements with officials, it is critical that the widest possible source of information is then uh, obtained. And that can be, if you like, whether it is if you like, coming from what is effectively a representative body of students or indeed sometimes from the individual experiences of, of students. You know, sometimes it is about uh, learning from the successes of the past. It is also actually about trying to ensure that where there has been perhaps a failure at some point, that we do not repeat that. So I think uh, certainly on behalf of both departments, I think we are open to have that, that engagement. And I think with the uh, restoration of devolution, I think that will also create an opportunity uh, where a lot of the groundwork which has been done, particularly by officials, is then able to be examined by ministers and also then scrutinised by the committee to make sure that what we have is fit for purpose as we move ahead. Well, George Robinson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, given the challenges in agreeing a joint up position in terms of 14 to 19 year, years of education and training, what can we expect to be addressed in a strategy? Well, alongside the Minister for the Economy, I recognise that the 14 to 19 education and training landscape is, is complex, so we are committing to working together to progress the development of a 14 to 19 strategy. In order to progress the developments of the draft strategy, the project has identified a number of work streams. 
based upon the original ministerial correspondence, which dates back to the, um, I think, to the last assembly, the issues that, are, uh, that arose both through the innovation lab in 2018, whenever it was progressed, and subsequent engagement with stakeholders. The identified areas that the project is focusing on include progression and pathways, funding, careers, curriculum delivery, and the post-16 education. So there's a wide range of those being covered by the work streams. The project's initial output uh, will be a high-level draft strategy, which will outline vision and the guiding principles. Now, the challenges associated with the current um, approach and what the features of a more strategic joined-up approach will be. But there's no doubt uh, that this will be cross-cutting. And I understand that the project is currently finalising baseline uh, position and that making arrangements to engage with further stakeholders, such as those that were mentioned by the previous questioner, to agree that the strategic pri priorities in the, the coming months and that we have something that's fit for purpose. Yeah, that's okay. Groupings. Yes, indeed. indeed. Uh, with, uh, just in relation to your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions two and nine together, come from a very similar uh, position. Um, in answer to the questions that have been posed, increasing uh, participation and awareness of apprenticeship programmes is a key objective for the Department for Economy as apprenticeships play a central role in creating an effective and sustainable pipeline for skills development across Northern Ireland. Around 6,000 new apprenticeship, apprenticeships are created by employers across Northern Ireland each year. Obviously, the number will vary to some extent from year to year, supported by the Department across a wide range of sectors. The Department supports apprenticeships by funding the cost of uh, off-the-job training through the Apprenticeship uh, NI and the higher level apprenticeship programmes. Apprenticeship funding is paid directly to further education colleges, universities and contracted non-statutory training providers operating across Northern Ireland, several of which are located in areas of deprivation. The Minister of the Economy has met with a number of employers and business organisations which are benefiting from the apprenticeship programmes. Minister Dodds also attended the Northern Ireland Apprenticeships Awards 2020 ceremony during the, uh, during the first Northern Ireland Apprenticeship Week and, and got to hear firsthand about the uh, positive impact apprenticeships are having on businesses, as well as the difference the programmes are making to the lives and careers of apprentices. The Department is working to increase demand for apprenticeships through a range of measures and has initiated a widening access and increasing participation project including considering uh, the current apprenticeship age policy and the uh, role public sector apprenticeships might play, improving support for employers, how participants uh, access partnership opportunities and what more can be done to widen access to expand the pathways to a greater range of participants, particularly amongst underrepresented groups. Well, Alex Easton. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister to tell me how we can ensure that local employers have the same rights as those in England and can access their contribution to the apprenticeship levy to fund apprenticeships? Thank the Member for his uh, supplementary. Obviously, the apprentice, apprenticeship levy is a UK-wide fiscal policy, and indeed the levy itself is um, a reserve matter for the UK Parliament. So while, uh, the, while Northern Ireland receives the Barnet Consequentials, from the levy, uh, this has not had a um, significant impact on the block grant. Although the collection of the levy is a reserve matter uh, with no scope for derogation from Northern Ireland, the delivery of, of apprenticeships is a devolved matter. So the Department provides funding to support the cost of apprenticeship training for private sector employees regardless of uh, the, level, uh, the level of their levy contribution. Uh, these Apprenticeships are largely demand-led programmes, and uh, as Minister, there will be an encouragement of all employees, uh, or employers, sorry, to avail of the programmes to drive forward business growth. The Department continues to consider the issues raised by, the, by Northern Ireland employers during the consultation of the impact of the levy in Northern Ireland, including issues, I think, around the uh, current age-related criteria, potential public sector apprenticeships which are effectively barred. Um, uh, at present, and how to improve transparency for employers on the level of funding, support, 
that are currently available through participation in apprenticeship programmes. I call Roy Bakes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister rightly referenced the scheme in England, uh, and he also indicated that there is a need to uh, increase the demand for these schemes. Would the Minister accept that in England I understand that it's, uh, 90 per cent of the cost is paid by government, 5 per cent by the employer, whilst in Northern Ireland 50 per cent is paid by the employer? Would he not accept that if we followed the English model, we would encourage many more firms to come forward and invest their time and energy uh, in developing the workforce for the benefit of the entire economy? Well, I think look, anything the department can do to help facilitate an increase in terms of the number of apprenticeships, I think, is, is something to be uh, certainly looked at and I think will be encouraged. I, I think in terms of the mix of funding, uh, I think where all of us would like to reach an ideal situation um, will need to be examined in the context of what available resources are there. And if, for example, we're going to change the mix to create a much greater um, resource allocation directly from, from government, that will need to be funded as part of the, the overall budget settlement. Uh, there will be examination on what is available through the Department of the Economy and what can be done in, in relation to that. But clearly, if there's going to be a shift in resources, that's got to be something which is centrally funded. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask how the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Education are working together to promote parity of esteem for apprenticeships as part of the 14 to 19 strategy? The member raised, I think, a very valid point, which is that while we've seen, for instance, broadly speaking, in terms of, of education, we've seen a, a upwards trend in terms of the academic success. I think there is an issue, um, and indeed it's an issue whenever I've spoken to CCEA, for instance to ensure that there is actually a much greater level, level playing field and acceptance that um, a, a non-academic route can also be valued um, within that. And I think that we need to ensure that there is that greater level of parity of esteem. Uh, within that context, I think we'll be considering uh, particularly what proposals we can get in terms of pathways, because I think it's both about clarifying uh, and indeed ensuring that, that society places that, uh, that level of parity esteem, but also ensuring that we've got clear pathways uh, for uh, non-academic routes, particularly into the business. That, I think, will be of value both to the uh, employees, potentially, and also to the employer, that they're not simply getting a, a, such a diverse range. And I think it is about, if you like, um, ensuring that, that we have that level of recognition. That's something both myself and the Minister will be working on as we take, if you like, the work that has happened. Um, in the, the non-devolutionary phase, and actually then to embed this into a proper 14 to 19 strategy. And I thank the minister for his answer so far. The latest NISA report on apprenticeships measures their programme success on apprentices completing their final year and attaining a qualification. But there is no reference to retention rates during first or second year, where apprentices are more likely to drop out. Will the Minister review how success rates are monitored on apprenticeship programmes? The Department will always want to take a look and see that from the point of view of either the investment that is put in or indeed particularly from the life chances of the young people who are going through the apprenticeships that we deliver through to a degree of success. So obviously we will keep under review uh, what monitoring takes place in relation to that. That is both in terms of the intake of um, apprentices that, that take place. But obviously the aim of this is not simply to get a year or two's training and for that simply to go to waste. Uh, so I think there is, the member makes a valid point to try to ensure that we get that follow through in terms of the uh, position of apprentices so that uh, we can ensure that this is actually helping to feed the economy because in many ways apprenticeships by their nature are not necessarily simply an end in themselves. They are a means to an end of ensuring both from the economic point of view that there is a flow through of, of uh, technically skilled um, workforce but also, I think, from the point of view of being able to transform the, the lives of the young people who are benefiting from that and helping, if you like, to develop them as economically active citizens as we move ahead. Paul, Jim Allister. Does the Department think that our larger employers who are paying the apprenticeship of EVI, the National Apprenticeship of EVI, does the Department think they're getting a fair deal? Yes, money comes back in Barnet Consequentials. But is that money even spent on apprenticeships? And are we not in a situation where major employers 
are paying a hefty levy but not getting anything like the return that their, their colleagues are in GB? I think members got to realise that, first of all, in terms of the levy that, that's made, it is something which is reserved matter. And so, therefore, the, the amount of money coming out from various employers is not set in Northern Ireland, it's not set by the Department. As I indicated, um, and indeed there would be some concerns, for example, uh, speaking as wearing my hat as, as Minister of Education, that there will be a levy that comes out of schools when there's no opportunity, for instance, for any level of apprenticeships that happen in terms of the, the public sector, you know, which means that, that effectively it, it becomes a, a level of drain um, on our resources. As indicated, I think in terms of the funding of apprenticeships, it is very much demand-led. And so consequently, while we don't have any particular control over uh, the amount of money that is um, taken out from the apprenticeship levy, uh, I think, again, part of this is to help both facilitate and encourage employers to take on apprenticeships. And indeed, what is drawn out is very much within the hands of the employers themselves. That is something, I think, which is helped be managed by the various sectoral uh, bodies that have been set up, looking at various sectors of, of the education. Uh, sorry, at, at the economy. But in many ways, uh, the department, from that point of view, can be the facilitator. It cannot be uh, the provider which says, here is precisely uh, where this money is, is diverted. It's got to be demand led. All clear, Bailey. Um, could the Minister let us know what, what the balance between available apprenticeships for those educated to degree level and those perhaps not to degree level would be within the department and where? Um, we can get information on all available apprenticeship courses. Is that published by the department? First of all, in terms of the first part of that, that uh, question, uh, obviously in terms of the, the information that they provide, the department can provide that, that information. Look, it's undoubtedly the case that in terms of the balance on the statistics side of it, uh, I think uh, the minister will be happy to write to you just with uh, those figures specifically. I don't have the uh, detail of the, the balance. What we have been trying to do, I think, as the department, is to try to um, encourage that level of, of um, uptake. So, you know, for instance, in terms of uh, the number of employers have increased, um, and indeed, we try to make sure that in terms of the, the balance that is there, uh, that through widening participation um, in apprenticeships, that there is an encouragement to those, uh, perhaps, who are coming from maybe a less academic background, indeed, maybe a, a background which doesn't always take up apprenticeships, uh, that there's greater availability. And there has been some level of, again, success with that. But as with all these things, there's a certain level of work in progress. Aram, Sir Declan McLear for your cash day. Call Declan McLear. Kermagat, a cash for three little hole. Question three, Minister. Uh, question three. Don't want to. Dissolution. The member question three has actually. Sorry, question three. Sorry. Apologies. Thank so, you with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll also take question five with question three. Um, following the receipts of updated broadband coverage data from suppliers during the procurement process, the number of premises in, in the targeted intervention area has been reduced to just over 79,000. That means that some 18,000 premises are already or will be able to access services of 30 megabits per second or greater over the period of the open market review. This is viewed as positive news as the public funding together with the anticipated bidder contribution would potentially go further in extending coverage across a reduced intervention area. The significant proportion of the 18,000 or so premises uh, removed from the initial target intervention area relate to data uh, refresh exercise carried out by a major supplier on a UK national basis. Uh, Mr Dodds is satisfied with the progress that is, uh, the progress followed, as the outcome has been validated by the Building Digital uh, UK or BD UK, and their assurance has been provided uh, to all UK regions and devolved institutions. Over 95% of the revised target area is rural, as defined using the NIS uh, guidelines uh, as band H uh, villages with a population of less than 1,000 and premises that are in open countryside. Analysis undertaken by the Department and advice from independent advisers indicates that it is not possible to prioritise specific geographical areas without potentially sacrificing overall coverage, increasing costs and slowing delivery. 
while the precise number and location of premises that will directly benefit will not be known until after the contract award, the aspiration of the Department continues to be to maximise broadband coverage from the funding that is available. Um, August, and I uh, thank the, the Minister for, for his response. And the Minister will be aware from my previous question of him and his former role as Education Minister that we are very interested in Project Stratum in the Fermanoma district, which is the worst in these islands in terms of uh, access to superfast broadband. Um, will, the, will the Minister give his assessment? Um, does, he, sorry, does he believe that the Department of the Economy are accurate in their assessment that there are 18,390 fewer premises will be required on the project, uh, fast problem under Project Stratum? I appreciate the concerns that the member has raised, particularly um, in relation to the Fermanagh and Ome area. I mean, the statistics that, that I would have are based upon um, the uh, sort of constituency of returns rather than necessarily the council areas, which would suggest that, in terms of current coverage, uh, that I think Fermanagh and South Tyrone. Would have the, the lowest level would be uh, of above 30 uh, megabits, um, and that uh, West Rhone, I think, would be the, the second lowest. And so, you know, I appreciate the concern that the member has, has done. I, I can only, as we reiterate the assurance in terms of the accuracy of the, the figures, um, that obviously these have been something that, in terms of the rolled out uh, side of it, um, that have been verified, I think, on a UK wide basis, that uh, it is something that, that is accurate. Uh, clearly, from the point of view of, of what is still to be covered uh, from the position, that, particularly of West Tyrone, the member's uh, constituency, um, I think covers that there are approximately um, just under 10,000 premises within the West Tyrone constituency that currently don't have access to that 30, 30 megabits and are uh, within the, the overall 79,000 that we're looking at as a, a target intervention. The aim will be to deliver the whole um, project. As I said, this is very much based, particularly as 95% of this is in, rural, is in rural parts of Northern Ireland, so that we can actually have um, those from a rural background on a very level playing field with those um, in other parts of, of Northern Ireland. There is, I think, uh, variations throughout Northern Ireland, uh, and really outside of perhaps some parts of Belfast, in fact, even within that, there, there are even some pockets within very urban constituencies that don't have the, um, the full rollout of. Um, 30 megabits at present. Call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Um, you spoke, Minister, of villages less than 1,000 people uh, going to be targeted for this broadband, which uh, I think is excellent. However, um, you also talked about value for money. And once again, this seems to... This seems to uh, avoid those most rural areas that still won't have broadband at the end of this, uh, at the end of the rollout. For, for example, you talk you, this value for money in rural areas. You don't get value for money if you're going to target those most rural, most isolated. I think, to be fair, and I, um, I'm not sure you used actually the expression value for money. I think it's about trying to ensure that, that whatever resources we have are spread as, as widely as possible. The reference, I think, specifically, um, and again, may have um, given a slightly wrong impression. When I talked about settlements of below 1,000, that was also covering whether it's open countryside. The definition, I think, is, as they call it, band 8 within the NISRA statistics, would suggest that that is, if you like, used as part of the definition for the rural side of it. So using that condition, uh, it is the fact that 95% that of the 79,000 targeted will be in that band aid. So that can be smaller villages, but it can also be individual properties in open countryside. So that is meant to cover uh, both those. Uh, as indicated, I think the aim is to get that, that uh, level of coverage throughout Northern Ireland as, as a whole and cover if you like, even those individual properties. So it's, it's not aiming at least to discriminate against um, any sort of uh, individual. Clearly, if, if we're in a position Hopefully that will be 100% coverage, or at least we will get the vast bulk of, uh, of the areas covered. Well, Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for his response today and his new role in his new ministry. Uh, I welcome, obviously welcome the Minister's commitment to deliver on this project, with £150 million being allocated through confidence and supply. 
Can the Minister advise when the contract is likely to be in place and when installation work is planned to commence? Okay. In terms of the, um, I think if you give me a moment, in terms of, uh, obviously there, there's an issue in terms of securing all of the funding. Um, as mentioned, has been made. Obviously, this was initiated through confidence supply and puts it probably in a different position to some of the projects. We're in a situation that, um, from that point of view, uh, the uh, in terms of the delivery timetables. Obviously, there's ongoing work with the with Treasury in relation to that. But in terms of the open market side of it, the contract is expected um, to be awarded in September of this year. The Department's most early engagement with industry indicates that about a six to nine month period is required for network design and delivery preparation. So it's therefore anticipated that we probably won't see the deployment of infrastructure won't be commencing until uh, April of 2021. But the aim would be that the uh, that we're looking at the earliest point of completion, it would probably take about three years to, to roll out as a minimum period. So this is not something which is going to happen instantaneously, but will happen a level of progression over a period of time to be able to deliver this. Iram Sir Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer so far. Minister, uh, I think you'll, you'll join in acknowledging the importance of this uh, important infrastructure, particularly for rural communities like West Tyrone. When we see the closure of rural banks, when we see uh, the, the homework now being done online, and also uh, the benefit system being online, so it's vitally important for my constituents. You've clarified there's 10,000 homes in West Tyrone affected. I think. Minister, what's the figure for Fermanagh? And also, Minister, um, uh, how, how quickly do you think this will be rolled out in terms of my constituency that is suffering quite a bit? Uh, well, I suppose, first of all, in terms of the figures for... Obviously, we're taking this as the number of premises within West Tyrone that currently don't have access to the 30 megabits. Uh, I suppose, to be precise, the exact figure that, that we have uh, from the Department's point of view is 9,973 premises uh, within that. Now, uh, in terms of time frame, uh, we won't know the specific sort of time frame until uh, we've had the, all the evaluation of bids and contract award because time frame will play a part of that. As indicated to the previous speaker uh, or the previous questioner, uh, we're looking at infrastructure starting in 2021 and hopefully being completed at the earliest in 2024. Uh, in terms of the comparison on numbers, um, as indicated on, uh, I think, to some extent, to, the, uh, to one of the previous um, questioners. Uh, the position, I suppose, is that the West Road at the moment would have the weakest level of, of provision, um, and I think stands in terms of those that are not receiving um, the full uh, 30 megabytes or below. Sorry, those that are above 30 megabits in West Road is 74%. Uh, from Anna South Tyrone, uh, as a constituency, would be at a lower level than that, at around about 70%. So that would suggest um, that I don't know offhand what the, um, uh, the exact population of both West Tyrone and Fermanagh, uh, South Tyrone, but proportionately, it would mean that, that there would be a slightly higher number to be delivered within the Fermanagh, South Tyrone uh, area. Uh, but that compares, I think, across the piece with the, uh, the next lowest percentage would be mid Ulster at 76 per cent and South Down at 78 per cent. So it is obviously the case that, um, and there is no constituency at present, that is 100 per cent uh, above the 30 megabits of the, that may be regarded as being super fast on that, on that basis. Uh, but clearly the more rural the constituency, uh, the lower the provision at, at present, which means the higher the, the level of intervention that will, will take place. As indicated, that is around about 12.5% of, um, of the overall amount of, of properties that will need to be on premises that will need to be uh, hit will come from the West Tyrone area. Brief question from Mr. Humphrey. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. He's doing rightly in his double-jobbing double role. Uh, Minister, you will, I'm sure, accept that Belfast uh, Zoo is an important uh, regional attraction for Northern Ireland, important in terms of tourism, in terms of animal husbandry and in terms of education. Will the Minister commit to meet with the directors of Belfast City Council to take forward Belfast Zoo and develop it as a growing and important, as I have said, tourism development in uh, Belfast? Well, uh, there hasn't been, the Member's right in terms of there hasn't been any recent engagement between the Department of the Economy and Belfast City Council in relation to 
the Belfast Zoo, or indeed the zoo site. As with other departments of the Northern Ireland Executive, the Department of Economy is facing a very budgetary challenging environment. So any potential future spend for tourism development at the Belfast Zoo would need to be considered in the context of the emerging tourism strategy and strategic priorities for the economy. However, I think that that strategy needs to be based upon the greatest level of knowledge and engagement. Uh, and so I'm sure the Economy Minister will be happy and keen indeed to meet with representatives of the City Council uh, to look at what is essentially I suppose, almost a regional facility in terms of the zoo. And that ends uh, the questions to the Minister. We now move to the topical questions. I guess Aram, Sir, Emma Rogan for New Case. I call Emma Rogan for a question. Um, can I ask the Minister um, what action will be taken to help improve the pay conditions for childcare workers in light of findings published in the Irish Congress of Trade Unions report on the sector? I think in terms of broad development of childcare, obviously again uh, this is something which is to a certain extent cross-cutting, and particularly as regards the executive as a whole. Um, I think as, as part of that the Department of Education uh, is aiming very soon to bring a uh, childcare strategy to the executive, obviously in terms of what the, the level of support for any workers will, uh, will form one element as that goes ahead. It is clear that if there is going to be a further level of, of intervention within that and a greater level of support for childcare, that is something which uh, the overall executive will need to be able to uh, commit to, because while Childcare strategy lies within the Department of Education, and obviously implications in terms of uh, certain economic facilities. There is not the budget within the Department of Education to, to pay for an expansion per se. So it will need to be a, a, an executive commitment as a whole. It is obviously, in terms of the broader childcare strategy, a commitment to increase the offer uh, is made within New Deal, New Approach, and so therefore there is a requirement. That, having said that, obviously the executive will have to weigh up the various pressures that are there, because the uh, amount being sought has been well highlighted by the Finance Minister and others, the amount being sought from a range of activities that are there are beyond uh, what the overall budget will be, and that, I suppose, is also on a, another track. The level of support, I know the Finance Minister has been engaging with Treasury on this issue as well, to try to ensure that there is that support, particularly for the delivery of New Deal, or New, new Decade, New Approach. The report published in June 2019 highlighted that childcare workers are paid below the median rate of other workers and are less likely to be paid the real living wage despite the important work that they do. Meanwhile, average weekly childcare spend by workers here is higher than in England, Scotland and Wales. Will the Minister address these issues affecting childcare workers and working families? Again, part of stuff is, and there's a conjunction of issues within that. Uh, obviously, an expanded childcare offer is critical to, the, uh, to actually being able to both support our education system, because those who have got that, that earlier intervention is important. So there is an educational bonus. There is also an economic bonus, because uh, the aim is to provide, uh, and particularly the focus has been on three to four-year-olds, is to provide uh, an affordable childcare offer. Uh, that will require a level of investment, as I said, from the executive. Uh, that is not to say as well that in terms of any childcare strategy that will purely focus in on the three to four uh, years. And I know it is an issue we will be coming back to in debate uh, tomorrow. Uh, but any degree of increase, even in the offer that can be made to three to four year olds, will require a large expansion of the sector. So at present, for instance, uh, around about 62 per cent of those who are receiving uh, support through the preschool programme are getting it on the basis of being a part-time place, and that's something which, which does need to, to change. Uh, and I think with expansion will also create further opportunities for people in terms of a workforce side of it. But as we move ahead, and this is why it's not simply a question of getting some additional resources, simply putting it in and it happening. Uh, part of that will also need to look at where we can have workforce development, where there can be uh, a greater level of support on that side of things. So there is a more holistic approach which will mean that even if there is a green light given by the executive to a childcare strategy, this will not be something that will be able to be delivered overnight, but will require a period of time to help build up the, the sector. Uh, much of that is revenue-based, but there will also need as part of that to be a certain level of, of capital assumption uh, that is made within that as well, because we simply do not have the scale of premises, or indeed in some cases where there is a situation in which a childcare provider is providing one group of, of 
children in the morning and one group in the afternoon. If we move to a situation where there's more full-time places, that would create a, a degree of pressure, particularly both uh, on the capital side as well. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The collapse of the airline flyby resulted in job losses, customer chaos and a direct hit to our local economy, particularly to the tourism sector. Can the Minister advise what efforts are being made to mitigate against the current difficulties being experienced at Belfast City Airport and beyond? There has been engagement. I know that um, flyby was very much an anchor tenant. Uh, an anchor airline at Belfast City Airport. Uh, now, clearly there was some work that uh, went on in January of this year with the UK government when it announced that they had reached an agreement with the shareholders of Fly B, uh, putting more money into the business, but on the basis of there being reviews into both uh, air passenger duty and connectivity. Very specifically uh, as regards that, but that obviously tended not to be enough. And I suppose we can speculate, for instance, to what extent the current problems that have been there in terms of travel have exacerbated the situation with the, the coronavirus. Um, as such, the, uh, the Minister met with the airport management on the 5th of March 2020 uh, and was encouraged to note that the airport have stated that they have an interest in all of their route network and are confident of announcing backfill within the next few days and weeks. As a result, I think that the Chief Executive uh, Officer of Belfast City Airport have been able to reach agreement with Logan Air to take up the first two of those slots. And it is hopeful that there will be sort of good news as we move forward. Uh, that is, if you like, the very specific issue in terms of that particular element of Fly B. But clearly, if there's to be a flourishing of the overall situation, air connectivity, which is a reserved matter, there is, as well as that, it's been something which has been raised um, with both the UK Minister for Aviation, Paul Maynard, uh, who the the Minister has met with, and also with the Secretary of State. So both air connectivity and air passenger duty are things that need to be thoroughly examined. Because of uh, our geographical location, we have a dislocation, uh, which means that there cannot be simply, for instance, even a substitute for travellers that are available in uh, other parts of the United Kingdom in terms of road or rail infrastructure. So it's important that the government uh, takes heed of the very clear message that the Minister has given uh, to the, the government ensures that there is a thorough review of those which leads to actually changes in terms of that APD and air connectivity. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Fly B cited COVID-19 as being the final stress for their business that forced closure. Can the Minister advise what measures are being considered or delivered by the Department of the Economy to ensure businesses and our economy in, as, in general is being protected as best possible against the impact of COVID-19. You know, the, the member rightly, I think, highlights that, that COVID-19 was seen very much as the final straw for uh, Fly B. I mean, we should recognise that, that unfortunately Fly B was in difficulties prior uh, to that, which led to um, intervention by the, the government. In terms of uh, in terms of the broader preparations, we're working. The part of the economy is working closely with the rest of the executive. We're due, I think, on Wednesday, obviously, to, um, and also particularly working with Treasury, because it is likely, I suppose, we'll be seeing the budget announced on Wednesday. That will look, I suppose, particularly at what additional measures can be put in place to provide levels of protection for business. And some of those will be, um, well, we can speculate, if you like, on what, what some of those will be, but we need to ensure that there is then not follow through for Northern Ireland businesses. Uh, and some are likely, I think, to be maybe direct support for businesses. Some will also be actually about seeing at least if there can be a postponement of some of the burdens that are there uh, on businesses as well. The department will work closely with its counterparts in London to ensure that the, the full range of measures um, are available to do that. But there's no doubt that we're in a fast-moving situation, and so therefore it will be a question of trying to anticipate where possible uh, where changes can take place and be able to then implement those as quickly as possible. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, further to the question around preparations in relation to the coronavirus, can the Minister say whether or not uh, she has had any um, uh, discussions with the Communities Minister in relation to the establishment of a hardship fund for people who are in zero hours contracts? Well, I think there is ongoing. I mean, I, I should say, I know we're in a, an era of fluid gender re, uh, recognition in, in relation to it, but. Uh, and I know there's an issue of self-identification, but I wasn't really aware the member was going to, to uh, self-identify me in terms of uh, 
uh, in terms of my gender. Um, look, in terms of that, there will be, as, as part of that, uh, the UK Action Plan uh, has looked at the issue of the impact upon um, particularly workers, indeed, with, in terms of voluntary leave, for instance, ensuring then that uh, there can be a uh, where there are particularly temporary absences, that is able to kick in at an earlier stage and ensure then that, that those workers are covered. Uh, we'll be working, I think, with both the UK government and seeing, I suppose, again, where there are any uh, examples from other devolved institutions. I suppose, again, it's about seeing what additional money can be brought in and then what, what could be spent, because also, again, we can't spend beyond uh, what, is, what is available in that, in that regard. Um, but I suppose the Department will be looking and having those ongoing discussions to try to ensure that there's the, the maximum provision that is made to combat the, the economic impact of coronavirus. Question for Linka, <coughs> Dolores Kelly, supplementary question for Lord. I, I trust the Minister will understand and appreciate that my question referred to the Minister of the Economy and thus the she and haven't had, it was not an attempt to realign his gender in any way. But uh, I, I don't think, my, um, um, that people listening in will be uh, content with the, que the answer given because people will be wondering in relation to self having to self-isolate who are on zero hours contract or, or who are self-employed that much more needs to be done. So will the Minister undertake to, to actually urgently address this matter and provide some confidence to those people affected? I'm sorry that the inadequacy of my answer has uh, disappointed the member in relation to that. Look, I think there is ongoing work that will be taking place and discussions between the Northern Ireland Executive and the Department of the Economy, particularly in Treasury, within that. Uh, in terms of the detail of what emerges out of that, I think, to be fair, this may be a case that, that first of all, will be responded to as soon as it, it can be, but also in terms of some of the detail of that will lie, I think, within the direct remit and information of the, the Minister for the Economy. And I'm sure, from that point of view, as announcements are made, uh, members indeed all those who I think all of us are in a, a very concerning situation uh, will be able to be informed of developments as they take place. I call Karen Mullen for a question. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister to outline whether the Department of Economy has had any discussions with the Department of Education about developing a workforce strategy to increase teacher numbers in the Irish medium education sector. I've met, from, from that point of view, um, there will be ongoing discussions in relation to that. There's an unusual situation, which is obviously, from the point of view of setting the, the, setting the numbers of any section within teacher training, the Department of Education does that. Department of the Economy um, is responsible also from um, the, the point of view of paying for that. I, I've met um, with representatives of CNG, who I think are drawing up sort of more detailed proposals. Uh, and from that point of view, um, I am certainly uh, taking on board what's, what's being said there would form the basis of any levels of discussion within that. I think they have uh, some thoughts initially in relation to that. We've got to scope that out to ensure that what is there is something that is, is deliverable. I think there's also the issue uh, in terms of Irish medium education in terms of training is what is done, if you like, in the, the medium term of training because clearly you can't turn someone from simply a student, even a postgraduate student, a teacher overnight. Uh, so even if there was additional numbers provided this September or the September after in connection with that, they would then be actually seeing what interim measures can be put in place to ensure that there is uh, sufficient support that's been provided uh, for the sector, indeed all sectors, to meet the, uh, the needs of their, of their students. And that's also something we'll be working with the sectoral body on uh, to see if there's any interim measures. And whether that's a question of identifying those who could, uh, who've got maybe teaching backgrounds who could go some sort of conversion course or um, examining what audit there's not, you know, I'm open to whatever suggestions can be, be done. The main aim is to ensure that there is sufficient numbers of teachers that, that are able to be able to provide uh, for the students that uh, need taught. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, I think we sort of crossed over there on the education. Um, I also thank you for your meeting with Synergy and your, 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 your uh, action already. Um, I suppose in terms of working with your colleague in the Department for Economy, it's about um, ensuring that those increased resources will be provided. They uh, facilitate the teaching of subjects through Irish medium, as it is the fastest growing education sector here at the minute. Well, it's important that, that uh, 
that what is there in terms of initial teacher education is fit for purpose and provides for that. Obviously, the specifics, while we'll be working on the numbers issue, indeed, what interim measures, longer term commitments in terms of uh, what is provided financially, obviously, that will be a matter that will also involve and directly involve the Department of the Economy, but I'm sure we'll be mindful to the comments that the member has made. That concludes topical questions to the Minister. I thank the members and the Minister for their cooperation throughout. And if members just please take their ease as we move to the next item of business.